So I think we're connecting. Oh, Lena's messaging. So Le Lillian, are we broadcasting? Yep, we're broadcasting. So you can see in the participants tab, we've got seven people uh, in the room. Oh, great. Nine. All right, I did Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. So we're going to be starting in just a few minutes. We'll let everybody. We are recording. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. So thanks for joining us uh, for this webinar today on microcertification business models in higher education. My name is Emma Gooch, and I'm the program lead at eCampus Ontario uh, for our microcertification initiative. And before I pass it off to today's speaker, Don Prezant, I'm going to be going over a few housekeeping items. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar, which means that your microphones are automatically muted. Uh, if you want to ask a question using your microphone, you can use the feature at the bottom of your screens to raise your hand and one of us can take you off mute so that you can ask your question. Uh, but there's also a handy Q&A feature that you can ask Don questions using. Uh, so Don will have time at the end of his webinar um, for discussions and questions. So we encourage you to please ask away. Um, and this, the Q&A feature also has a upvote, quest, upvote feature. So you can upvote what you want answered and we'll get to those questions first. Um, you will also notice that there is a chat button on the bottom of your screens. So we ask that you please introduce yourselves in the chat and you can use this space for questions through, for comments throughout the webinar. And just a note that this webinar is being recorded and we'll make this uh, recording available to you guys on our social media channels as soon as it's ready. And before I pass this off to Dawn, I just wanna give you some context for today's webinar. So in late 2019, eCampus Ontario commissioned an environmental scan of international microcertification business models in order to help us shape, shape a shared approach to al the alternative recognition of learning. Don Prezant was awarded this contract and today's webinar will feature his findings from this report. The full report has been published on the eCampus Ontario website and we'll make sure to share that link to it in the chat if you haven't already seen it. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Don Prezant. Don is a leading expert on open badges and micro-credentials in Canada. He's a longtime consultant for eCampus Ontario, as well as Polytechnics Canada and Algonquin College. Don is also the president of Learning Agents in cancred.ca, which is a digital credentialing platform based on open badges. So I'll now pass this off to Don so that he can start. And Don, right. I'm gonna start, stop my share and you can just take over now. Okay, thank you very much, Emma. I'm very, very pleased, very excited to be here today to have the chance to show you uh, the results of the work that we've been uh, doing. Um, and I'm gonna share, there we go. So I was hoping to uh, be um, presenting this at the forum, that wasn't possible, but then we figured it would be an even better thing to present it uh, virtually. And uh, gosh, with COVID-19, all of a sudden, uh, we just seem so prescient. Um, so I am going to just give you a bit of background uh, on this. Um, Emma's spoken about uh, what eCampus Ontario has been doing in, in, a, in its uh, leading way to uh, build uh, recognition ecosystems. Um, there was some work early on with the Sandbox. Uh, eCampus Ontario runs its own uh, passport, which is a recognition hub. It's uh, led the way in terms of self-directed learning with Ontario Extend. Um, there have been uh, now three forums uh, that have uh, run, first uh, the Open Badge forums and then the MICA certification forum in 2020. We have the pilot projects that are just uh, winding up in uh, 2020. And then the micro certification principles and framework, which I think is actually a, a wonderful addition uh, to uh, the ecosystem in general. And now this, this report for micro certification business models. So eCampus Ontario has been very busy uh, in this regard. Um, 
the way uh, it was presented to us at Learning Agents was there are a number of sort of perceived barriers to um, uh, adopting micro certifications. And here, here are just some that were given somewhat informally when we were um, framing this project. And they, they seem to be causing a lot of friction for people. And yet, there's a growing practice beyond the borders of Ontario and Canada. So what could be done to um, get rid of that friction? What could be done to oil the gears? So uh, hence the report. So the report, the intent of the report is to learn from the practices of others outside Ontario and Canada. Uh, a snapshot of international practices in um, micro-credentials, micro-certifications, in, um, I'm saying FE, that's a more international term, that would be more like community colleges and vocational training, but also higher education. Um, so further education, higher education. Um, intend, intended to be representative rather than exhaustive. This is not a, a statistical survey, it's more a, a, a paradigms, a set of paradigms, you might say. And it's intended to help Ontario institutions get started by answering some nagging questions, getting some insights from the early pioneers, helping institutions actually see themselves in uh, the actions of other institutions saying, oh, they're not so different from us, maybe we can do something similar. And the idea to indicate also beyond the, uh, the notion of um, badging at your institution is to think of yourself as part of a larger uh, ecosystem and directions for, for that. So the intent in general is my fond hope that this report is um, tool, a set of tools that you can use to recognize practice, to orient yourself in, in practice, and then start thinking like a menu for design and developing your own uh, badge systems, your own badge badging uh, micro certification strategies. So, um, and I mentioned that we competed for this. This is uh, part of the reasons we um, have, we got the contract for doing this, so a fair amount of background in um, uh, the field going back to 2011. Um, and uh, we actually proposed uh, one of the uh, we proposed a project for one of the 30 um, uh, sponsored projects that MacArthur Foundation did. Sadly, we did not get it. Otherwise, you might have seen something about badges and essential skills um, as of now. But uh, since then, I've been working internationally uh, with the Open Recognition Alliance that uh, uh, grew out of the Badge Alliance, which grew out of the, in the initial Mozilla Foundation uh, inception. Currently working with the Open Recognition Alliance, I recently became an ambassador for Open Recognition, uh, but also working with uh, We Are Open Co-op, for example, helping them uh, get their badge wiki going. Uh, we're currently a member of IMS Global Learning Consortium. So we know a lot about the uh, technology and what people are doing with the technology. And then we have quite a bit of background in the Canadian context. Uh, we developed the first uh, iteration of the forum in BC, uh, and that was moved uh, very quickly uh, uh, snapped up very quickly and moved to Ontario in 2017 um, and uh, working with CAPLA uh, for the recognition of prior learning, which is what a lot of this is about. And I'm happy to say I've earned uh, an Ontario Extend Experimenter badge from uh, participating at TESS. So we live and breathe this and have done so since 2011. Uh, the method for producing this, the idea is um, recognize uh, patterns and uh, create models validate those, um, select some interviews and try and get some color commentary, revise the models based on the, the feedback and release the report, which is now available on the website. Um, I will say that um, we, the report was a little too long to begin with. Um, so we had to cut it back quite a bit in order to come in under the translation budget. Uh, the longer version is available. Feel free to reach out to me and I'll be hinting at what you might see if you were to look at that. Everything okay so far, pacing wise, et cetera? Emma, are there, is there anything that I should be aware of? I think we're good, Don, thanks. Oh, okay, thanks. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, not a walkthrough, but a jog through of the uh, document, maybe a power walk. Um, so the, the idea here, um, there was some work done um, last year with regard to shared services and the idea of shared service models. And that was what was uh, presented to uh, myself uh, here at Learning Agents to just present to people something they could see themselves. So running from left to right, 
you might have a department, say continuing education, that starts experimenting with badges. You might have an institution-wide thing happening, or you might have a consortium of like-minded institutions agreeing that they were going to uh, work together um, around uh, microcertification. You might have something where uh, it might be an NGO, perhaps a, a government-funded NGO that's saying, this is the way, this is the way that we're going ahead. So that would be the idea of centralized leadership. And then some industry-led, and that might get into things, um, well, I'll be talking to you about the IBM example and alluding to a couple of other examples where uh, large corporations are, are leading the way. So some, some examples here of those. So I mentioned continuing education. Um, uh, Deakin is uh, an example that's in the long version. RMIT we feature in this report. Um, the um, Otago uh, Polytechnic is also uh, featured there. OERU in the longer version. Uh, but we do talk about boat, Baju uh, Veratus as an example of um, Territoire Apprenant and um, our learning regions. And then uh, the NGO led that would be uh, SurfNet in the Netherlands. And I've mentioned IBM. So what we try to do for people is to just show at a glance, and this is not, I wouldn't say it's scientific. I would say it's, uh, it has been validated by the people we interviewed. But the idea here is what are the pros and cons, um, affordances and um, um, risks you might run by taking the different models? And I'm not gonna read all of this for you, but uh, it's, it's just intended again to just orient you and sort of see yourself. Do we wanna just experiment as this little thing that um, is a little more autonomous, but maybe a little less continually funded? Do we wanna just join in with other people and, and mostly watch and then start to dip our toe? Do we want to sort of sign on with, um, with uh, somebody like IBM or even Salesforce and, and just work with them that way? Um, and uh, hopefully this presents that for you. Um, what this is in a sense is uh, something I presented to audiences at um, um, op Open Badges forums in the past is you can see yourself as just one entity or you can see yourself as part of a larger picture. So this would be the uh, department versus an institution. Here we start bringing in other elements in the ecosystem. So what we're presenting here is a way of uh, walking your way through this. So let's, um, we have those models, those five models. We also uh, thought, well, that's, that's great, that's useful, but there's, why are we following these models? What other ways can we describe uh, these models? So we have um, uh, about eight key dimensions uh, that were uh, prioritized by uh, feedback from TV Ontario, or sorry, TV Ontario, my past, uh, eCampus Ontario. And um, I'll just present them here. The thing to get across here is you'll notice, um, I'll just do a couple and you can see the pattern, is it, to say we have the perp, you know, the dimension and then the sort of sub dimensions of the dimension. And I didn't try and fill up, you know, five in all cases. It was meant to be descriptive. In some cases, um, uh, there are not higher education examples of these, but we did validate it with uh, people from higher education. Um, and uh, possibly those are empty slots that people can look at when they're coming up with badging strategies or, or looking at um, iterating their, their badging strategy and saying, if we were to reach out further or extend our scope, how might we do that? So in terms of purpose, um, transition from K to 12 into higher education or from adult learning into higher education. Uh, we don't have so many examples of this um, currently, so that would be a bit more of an empty slot. I would say a lot of it is about transition to employment um, and then lifelong learning, con ed, et cetera. Um, um, and a, but well represented is also, I would say, uh, student success. So things um, like, um, uh, study skills and, and things of that nature. So in terms of the learning context, um, I'm going to show you the slide from uh, Penn State that somewhat inspired this, uh, but essentially you can have things that are embedded in curriculum, you can have things where uh, students are, it's extracurricular, uh, RMIT has a number of examples of that, um, or you could have um, uh, uh, elements that would be uh, uh, 
co-curricular. So in other words, uh, perhaps uh, starting in student services. And then you have things like MOOCs, that would be more the open curricular. And then custom curricular, uh, Otago Polytechnic, for example, is doing a lot of contract training where they're relating needs in the workplace and relating it to uh, qualifications framework and the kinds of learning that they can do. And they're customizing curriculum ab about this. And also RMIT, uh, when they're take, they can take um, sort of a meta badge and then customize it for a particular curriculum, contextualize it for a particular curriculum in a particular course. So that's an example of that. Over on the right, a uh, little less about uh, personal curricular, some instances of uh, recognition or prior learning or PLAR, um, but uh, for example, BOAT, uh, the French example um, that I mentioned, do have some aspirational badges I would talk about. They have one for sustainable uh, development goals, for example, to say that I, I support the sustainable development goals. I will uh, continue to show value for this and people will endorse this. So it's a more of a, a personal mission kind of a badge. Uh, formality of recognition, pretty much what you'd expect to see here, uh, ranging from totally formal to totally informal. In the middle there, I've sort of made a couple of sub-slots to say that you might do something that's non-formal, will never be a credit, or you might do something that's non-formal, could be credited later. And actually, there's an example again of Otago Polytechnic, one of my favorite examples, uh, is um, they are now able to come up with micro certifications for credit, working with the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. But it, they envision something in the future where they wouldn't necessarily do that um, micro credential for credit, but they would make it creditable in the future, just using the same process, but not bothering to ask the authority whether it, they could credit it for them. Uh, assessment types. Um, I think what's dominant here is um, the idea of uh, online uh, course and then automated assessment, but there are many other ways of approaching this, um, ranging from a full up ISO certification where you do it fully ISO, um, psychometrically and it costs a lot of money to work with subject matter, ex a broad array of subject matter experts and come up with lots of um, a huge question bank and lots of distractors, et cetera, um, ranging all the way to uh, flexible assessment, which is again, Otago does a lot of flexible assessment where they uh, say, can you demonstrate you've achieved the outcomes uh, for this using authentic workplace evidence? And that's a bit like the Ontario Extend approach. Uh, in terms of skills alignment, a lot of talk we've uh, had in the past about uh, horizontal and vertical skills, and that was uh, also mentioned at the, at the forum, the micro certification forum and the folks from uh, Education Design Lab. Um, but uh, there are other ways of approaching this, um, other ways of looking at vertical, uh, which could be external or it could be internally um, uh, defined by uh, an organization, say a large, a large company. So IBM, for example, has its own vertical certifications. Portability, um, the idea here is to just look at the broad spectrum. And I, again, I don't have exact um, examples of all of these things, but you could have um, uh, RMIT, for example, has in its um, um, creds, uh, has uh, creds that can be used across departments and they just sort of pluck them. Maybe they contextualize them, maybe they just take them generically. Um, you could have uh, bilateral agreements uh, between uh, institutions uh, like um, a credit transfer and uh, perhaps uh, the credit bank. And the, there are actually starting to be examples of this with OERU and the long version, uh, OERU, OER Universitas, which um, uh, the members of that I have written down somewhere, but basically uh, Otago Polytechnic is the headquarters of that. And they actually have a protocol for uh, making credits um, portable across uh, jurisdictions. It's based on a Commonwealth of Learning framework that's been set up, a transnational qualifications framework. But other ways of doing it, there could be uh, industry standards based. So, so uh, um, the idea that the industry defines the standards, and actually we have an example with Madison Technical College 
um, Madison Area Technical College that uh, looks first at an industry standard and says, okay, we can, we can match uh, a course and a badge to that, and that's how they develop it. And then the employer looks at it and says, okay, that, that makes sense to me. This person should be able to do this job to this standard based on this badge. I'll, I'll recognize that. Um, authentication. Um, I uh, basically a lot of conversations about authentication out there. Um, this is, gets into conversations thinking about uh, blockchain and invigilation, which is a little sensitive at the moment, I think. Um, but there's a lot of people asking about this, and typically it's a worry that a lot of institutions have. Um, payment um, that was mentioned as one of the potential barriers. Uh, and a number of approaches to this. Um, mostly what it amounts to is if you're a full-time registered student and you're taking an, uh, an open curricular type of badge, you're typically not charged, but if you're coming from outside trying to do that same thing, you would be more like pay as you go. So um, how am I doing here? Not too bad. So this is the Penn State taxonomy. It kind of came up short in a number of ways, so that, but we used it as a, as a starting point. Um, here is a snapshot from RMIT where they, they have uh, what I was talking about with those creds. So over, um, they would have for the general public um, micro-credentials or for students that just say, oh, I want to work on my employability um, and my communication skills for the workplace or whatever, they would be able to take a, an open curricular micro-credential. But in some cases, they have what they call a lift and shift, where they take one of those open micro-credentials and bring it into a curriculum and maybe just sort of set it up a bit, but essentially send the student out to do that um, uh, credential and then basically come back in. So that's a lift and shift because they've done very little to contextualize that. They haven't customized any content, but then they can... They could, if they wanted, do a more integrated, embedded version where they would customize, contextualize that content more, say for uh, health sciences, and, um, and then assess that within the course. The less of that happening in RMIT, the lift and shift and the open curricular is obviously easier to do, but that's definitely a direction that they want to go. Um, Madison College, I've mentioned them. This is an example of um, aligning to external standards. So these are uh, medical nutrition standards that they've decided to align their badge to. That's going to help the portable value of the uh, microcertification. Um, um, I mentioned uh, horizontal uh, alignment. So RMIT has their 11 capabilities and uh, they're actually just getting into uh, revising those, and I think they're really mostly just adding a vertical dimension to them, picking up on hard skills that are becoming popular in the workplace. But over on the right, you have Otago uh, Polytechnic and their I am capable framework. We, we're still seeing a lot of sort of custom frameworks that are maybe based on sh generally shared notions of soft transversal skills, but we're not typically seeing uh, overall pointing to um, things like the essential skills. It's too bad I didn't get that funding way back. Um, so um, additional dimensions. Um, this um, these were validated by quite a few of the uh, interviewees, uh, and um, they're of varying importance, varying relevance, I would say, to people in, on, in Ontario. Uh, the notion of levels, we have the Ontario Qualifications Framework. <clears throat> it's accessed by some, it's not necessarily accessed by many, but um, it's got nowhere near the uh, recognition and value of the European Qualifications Framework. I have some examples of that. Uh, but then there are other ways of leveling a badge in a way that's not just saying this is beginner, this is bronze, silver, and gold. It's it's something. It's a level that exists outside of the of the um, the recognition entity, and it's a, sort of a, basically an external framework that you're pointing to. Um, so um, again, I have some examples of that later. Um, granularity. That's a big one. Um, depth. Basically, it comes down to effort hours or credits. Uh, the one big exception right now is RMIT and their skill points. I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about that later. Um, kind of an interesting formula that they, they have, which actually they're refactoring at the moment. Um, credential type. Uh, this is uh, more of a, 
an empty slot at the moment, I would say. Uh, not a lot of the higher education institutions are talking about these international industry standards for uh, credentials. So I'll, I'll have some more detail about that. Uh, delivery, not much to say here other than that we're certainly pivoting online, aren't we? Um, and then uh, stackability, mostly prescribed stacking. Um, I would still say that stacking is not huge. Um, just looking at some examples, even from uh, RMIT or, or even Otago, they're not um, really featuring this notion of, a, of a, a pathway leading up to a milestone similar to the Ontario Extend uh, pathway. Some talk about uh, open pathways and things like that. Uh, we, in the, the, the data set we looked at, we didn't see too many examples of that. Quality management, uh, typically that's internal. Uh, although uh, Otago Polytechnic is a what is it a level one uh, institution in the New, New Zealand uh, qualification uh, standard, um, New Zealand Qualifications Authority. So that's their external quality management. Uh, funding models, um, often internally funded. Uh, some of them are looking at sustainability or uh, more permanent funding. Uh, Otago is in the enviable position of uh, setting up badges for which students can be um, totally externally funded because they are accredited um, micro, micro certifications. Endorsement, this is an empty slot. Um, nobody really had, that we spoke to, uh, really had great examples of this. Uh, there are people who think they're doing endorsement and in fact are really just doing co-creation uh, with say employers, etc. Um, more examples of this uh, outside of higher education in Europe, um, and uh, we can speak to that later. Um, and then learner support, this was actually added uh, by Otago, um, who are very inspired by Southern New Hampshire University and a guy named, I think it's Paul LeBlanc. And uh, he was the one who sort of said, you should become a spin-off entity, and Southern New Hampshire, had, that's their, what's called their secret sauce is basically just totally engaging with the learners or right after they register, even before they register, setting up relationships with them and saying, being really proactive about support. So those are the um, models and those are the dimensions and just some examples of qualifications framework. Here's the Australian qualifications framework, which takes you all the way from uh, primary school all the way up uh, to a PhD in uh, 10 levels. And basically, they're leveling their badges to say that uh, this is, in terms of complexity, in terms of ambiguity, this is more at the master's level, or this is at the bachelor's level. So, for example, their hallmark badges are uh, at the bachelor's level. Their recognition of professional practices, practice badges initially came in at the master's level, but then they're, they're coming out with other ones at, at lower levels. And people, everybody knows what that means. That's the great thing uh, with having a national framework. Um, in terms of granularity, I mentioned um, RMIT and their skill points. So uh, the more skill points you would think, the better. Uh, and I'm just going to notice that my, my notes are being covered here. So, um, so um, basically they combine effort, duration, level of complexity, and rigor of assessment. And I, was, uh, I had a rubric shared with me the way it is now, but I was, I was told not to share it because um, they're they're refactoring it and they didn't want it to be uh, inappropriately shared so um that's something that it'll be some combination of like that of that again in the future but just as i say refactored um in terms of levels here's an example of a level that goes beyond uh qualifications frameworks to talk about this core skills for uh, work development. So these are uh, skills using digital based technologies and they have a level three, you're a capable performer. So uh, again, it's an attempt to point to something outside of the system to say, what if we all point to that and that have our market certifications refer in similar ways to similar things. So this is an example of that in terms of levels. Um, granular, okay, this is an example of granularities and levels and payment and quality. So in terms of granularity, they, they, they have a way of referring to their micro certifications in terms of weeks or hours or days. They don't say how many, but it gives you some idea. Uh, it's 30 credits in the NZQF at level seven, 
which is uh, a bachelor level, so that's a bachelor degree. And what I've shown you here on the right is mapping the NZQF to the EQF, which is kind of like a de facto meta standard uh, for, um, for credentials, which is used not only in Europe, but also by Australia, by um, New Zealand. Um, and I think as referenced by the transnational qualifications framework from the, of the Commonwealth of Learning. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a quality. So the NZQA, uh, they're NZQA accredited, so they get audited from time to time. So that's their quality. Uh, and also they actually have to submit um, their uh, proposals for uh, credentials to the qualifications authority to get them accredited to begin with. Um, and there's an interesting conversation coming out of that, which is that um, the qualifications authority doesn't allow them to disassemble bigger programs into smaller bits because they think that's just facile and um, it's not really what they're for. They do allow a more constructive approach where they say, if these things can be standalone and valuable on their own, if you want to work them together meaningfully into larger uh, clusters, larger uh, uh, qualifications, you may. So it's, you can go uh, inductively, you can't go uh, deductively, I guess, in terms of, uh, of granularity. So prescribed stacking, uh, apologies for the roughness of this slide. This is just an example of how you might get a certification as a dietary manager. That's a fairly old example. Um, Madison College, the Digital Credentials Institute, has come out with a, a taxonomy recently. Uh, it was part of their blog. So they talk about informal badges and formal badges, and they see value in both. And then within formal badges, they talk about, you know, is this just something where you sort of push through some content and show that you were listening? Or did you demonstrate something? Or are you starting to consistently produce something? Or, you know, does, does everybody say you're certified for this? I'm, I'm not totally on board with their de definition of certification, but it's, uh, you know, the, it's basically they're applying a level of consistency for what they're doing in the, their capacity um, of their business model, which has become that of a service bureau that works with a number of different organizations. So credential type, this is the, as I say, the, uh, um, Mostly the empty slot in terms of uh, higher education, all this may change as um, other sectors start to play more with the higher education institutions. So uh, the Institute for Credentialing Excellence is a great place to start for this kind of stuff. But uh, the ISO uh, 17024, for example, is that psychometric high level, high stakes certification model um, with ethics built in, et cetera. Uh, that a number of organizations uh, align to and then look for certification in. And then you have even for certificate programs where you take a course, show you've achieved the outcomes that are standards for that. And um, ASTM is one and then ICE Institute for Credentialing Excellence has its own standard for that. So this is something that may come on board more over time uh, as you start working with industry sectors or even large employers. Endorsement, I mentioned this is a, an old slide, but you can endorse badges, you can endorse issuers and their examples. And endorsing an issuer is a, a form of accreditation, which can be highly formal or it can be uh, more sort of pragmatic. Again, an empty slot for the moment. Um, so um, we're at the point, just time wise, um, I'm just going to. Uh, continue jogging, maybe pick up the pace a bit and go through some of the uh, profiles that we uh, uh, made it into the final version and then just allude quickly to the, uh, the ones uh, the, that didn't make it into the, the short version and then just talk about some next steps. So um, Madison College uh, is sort of morphed into uh, this Digital Credentials Institute, which sits within Madison College, it began as a continuing education um, uh, initiative, so a solo unit. Um, they were an early adopter. Uh, they um, basically were able to start in non-credit programs because they had more autonomy. Um, they saw a need 
um, as they started badging that they needed to be a lot more transparent about how their courses were put together, how the outcomes were developed, how those were assessed and recognized. And so it's been a great uh, source of improvement for them. Uh, the Institute, DCI, was set up in 2018, initially more about research, uh, but now it's is becoming mo um, doing a lot of hosting and consulting services, become a service bureau, essentially parlaying its experience into uh, a revenue stream for themselves using different platforms. RMIT, this is more of an institution-wide approach. Um, and um, basically uh, here, I've mentioned the transversal skills. Um, they're also working in ways of making it more seamless to go back and forth between sort of the open curricular into the embedded curricular, possibly ways of luring people in, starting for example with this future skills, which is kind of like uh, their sort of mini six week courses that people can come in, similar to perhaps um, Open University in a way. And I mentioned their skills points um, in terms of the uh, purpose, I, I noticed when I was going through their, their skills, I would add professional development for faculty there because uh, you'll see that uh, they have, you know, will ready for staff. So these blue ones are actual staff uh, badges. So that's uh, um, uh, just an element that was missed the first time through. Um, so they have, um, I mentioned the um, open open badges uh sorry yeah open badges for registered students and then they can be embedded in the curriculum the future skills skills points uh, they've actually paused for the moment because these have been very popular for them so they're just trying to get the platforms talking to it together they're using uh, salesforce for example and are working heavily with uh, trying to integrate better with their salesforce platform and just so to make that experience of bringing external people into the institution a lot smoother um, Otago uh, Polytechnic, my favorite example, I ended up talking to three different people uh, for this. Lots of pithy quotes coming out of it. Um, really interesting approach, uh, very entrepreneurial. Um, and one of the things I love about them coming at uh, this is uh, their focus on recognition of prior learning. They actually said they went a little too far in that direction to begin with. And what they realized what was for their uh, so-called B2 B to C approach. They have this business to consumer, business to business, which would be more uh, going into a business and saying, you know, what do you need and how can we uh, upgrade your workforce? And then G to C would be government sponsored um, type credentials based on their um, linking. Um, they said that they went a little too far into recognition of prior learning. So just be recognized for what you know and can do. Well, consumers probably just want to more take a course, but maybe they want to. Um, accelerate things or show that they've done at least part of it, but they, they like the overall structure, consumers do. Whereas in the B2B model, things would be much more customized and you start with where people are at and you work up um, where the gaps were. So um, they have an advantage in that um, they're headquartered, uh, OERU is headquartered where they are. So there's this sort of handover between uh, New Zealand credits into these OERU international credits. And they're actually working with uh, Humber um, in Ontario. They're partnered with this Global Polytechnic Alliance um, with Humber and uh, an organization, I can never remember the name of it, in uh, Denmark. Um, and helping them get up to speed with uh, some of the models that they've been developing. Um, and very much a startup, um, um, positive revenue streams. They haven't paid off their investment yet, uh, but things are looking very good for that. And um, they're definitely one to watch on a continuing basis. So, and that's basically me talking about all those things. Um, so, we wanted to open things up a, a little bit more uh, and, and talk about more open ways of dealing with microcertifications. And France is kind of ground zero for that kind of stuff right now. So if you look in the bottom left of the map there, you'll see this uh, new Aquitaine. And that is actually a dedicated passport and network of uh, largely educational organizations uh, that are doing sort of alternative approaches to microcertification in France. So um, they have, I mentioned the, uh, their own dedicated passports called Bay Connexion. They're developing a quality framework and this may be similar to um, elements of the uh, principles and, um, sorry, um, the, yeah, the eCampus Ontario principles uh, and framework document. Uh, 
but also sort of a, a, a voluntary, uh, we, we agree that our uh, microcertifications will support these things and have some element of um, um, uh, validation of that. So, um, but it's very much a sort of a broad spectrum. It's intended to reach out across other sectors and also bridge between K-12 into post-secondary, which as I mentioned, is a bit of a gap um, in what's out there right now. Um, so it's, it's again, something to watch because they have these aspirational badges that I've mentioned um, and um, they um, are trying to say, let's not just um, recolonize um, recognition uh, that was, you know, set up outside of higher education. Let's let's try and learn from what's out there. Let's try and uh, pick up some more open things and make them more accessible. So they're really interested in bringing in uh, underserved audiences, for example, and ways of making uh, recognition more um, accessible for underserved audiences. So SurfNet, um, this is a very large scale uh, project. Um, Kind of the key thing is uh, they're well funded over multiple years. They're huge, over a million students, 180 institutions. They've been exploring this and various pilots and proofs of concept since 2015. They're taking a very sort of measured, um, you sort of higher education, comfortable approach to uh, this kind of thing. They haven't so much uh, reached out of, of higher education yet. But it's definitely something to look at, very much a quality approach. They're really interested. They talk about having 50-year uh, micro-credentials and how would you make sure your micro-credential is good 50 years from now. And so they're starting to explore that. Uh, IBM Skills Academy, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. They've uh, presented several times. But it's a really good example of external enterprise learning, which uh, basically says in the old days, um, is in terms of trying to get people interested in uh, looking at uh, IBM uh, technologies in higher education, they, they didn't have a lot of success with that. Uh, but when they shifted to um, micro certifications, um, they made certification much more uh, bite sized for their, their workforce. They're able to attract people into the workforce to say that I can work with Watson, I can work with uh, this, uh, this you know, IBM framework and this IBM friendly framework, and they can educate their customers and recognize their customers for doing that. So uh, they're working with post-secondaries, as you can see, and they have different levels. One of, they have participation only badges, that's the Explorer one, and they, you can get mastery if you're assessed, and then instructors can be assessed, and then uh, again, more of a, a softer one, if you helped as a subject matter expert, you can be recognized for that. So additional content, this is what didn't make it in, <laughs> is uh, Deacon, I've mentioned Deacon a couple of times, so Deacon Hallmarks, uh, Deacon Recognition of Professional Practice. Um, Swinburne had a really interesting uh, model of um, basically uh, towards what they call a practice-based degree. I was really sorry to uh, knock that one out, but it just it was a little too different from some of the other ones. I don't know if Lou Mann's in the audience today. He's uh, on secondment, I think, to York University still, unless he's gone back to Swinburne already. It was really interesting conversation with him. Um, the European MOOC Consortium is trying to get on the same page, similar to uh, the eCampus Ontario framework. Theirs is a little more prescriptive, and I find, I find the eCampus Ontario framework a little more interesting. A University of Learning Store, that was again a, a collaborative uh, attempt from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison and a couple of other uh, universities to say, let's pool uh, a, a store for micro-credentials. A good idea. I think the execution could have been done a little better from what I heard of people, uh, the market research, what they imagined, what people would want wasn't really what people wanted and it was hard to, hard to maintain. Um, and uh, just moving on from there, uh, Bester, uh, early mover in Italy. Uh, we actually hosted a couple of EPIC conferences over there. You campus at you attended them. Um, Education Design Lab, you posted them yourself. The US Chamber, uh, you may have heard some mentions of that at the, the last forum. Um, they are talking about interoperable learning records that would go way beyond higher education. And it's something you take through life in a machine readable portfolio. 
Um, and then Salesforce has their own proprietary badging system, but they're a huge ecosystem in and of themselves. So it's become quite popular, huge numbers of badges there. LinkedIn has come on with their own skills badges. So people who, uh, if you're out there uh, creating um, um, Python badges, for example, you should know that uh, LinkedIn can um, give you five, sorry, 15 skills, 10 to 15 skill testing questions, and then give you a Python badge if uh, you answer those correctly. So it may not be quite the same weight, but it is LinkedIn and it is right in there and it's probably a single click to uh, incorporate in your profile. So it's something worth thinking about. IMS Global, um, they're uh, leading the um, standard, as you know. Um, the International Council on Badges and Credentials, um, that's actually eCampus Ontario has a role with that. It's leading the working group for higher education. A little bit emergent, uh, jury's out on, on what the um, uh, legs of that is. Uh, Digitary, um, I interviewed uh, Simone Ravioli from um, uh, Digitary, who was formerly with Bester, so uh, just because he's just so involved in a lot of the conversations, the international conversations that are going on about this, they may be playing a role in Canada in the future, depending how uh, a certain RFP comes out. And then uh, the Open Recognition Alliance, uh, I've talked about them in the past, uh, outgrowth of uh, the Badge Alliance, which is an outgrowth of the original uh, Mozilla uh, implementation, more of a grassroots community-based approach, but it's also behind the Open Recognition Ambassadors and the EPIC conferences. So uh, all of that you can read up on further. It's a total of 72 pages, something like that. Um, it was a good read, I would say. So um, summary of insights, uh, multiple models are possible. Everybody said that. So you can be a solar unit, and a, um, a you know institution wide, so you're already seeing that with Madison. Um, you can also be part of a peer group. So uh, Mohawk, for example, is part of the IBM Skills Academy, and that's this thing they're doing over here as they work here. Um, so uh, in terms of, um, I think the overall theme is portable recognition for careers rather than necessarily success within higher education or uh, student engagement. So in other words, what that relates to is workplace value versus uh, academic value. And one of the interesting things that came out of that was uh, Andy Kilsby at uh, uh, Otago Edubit said that uh, you may put together uh, an NZQA approved micro-credential and think it'll grow up into, I don't know, a one year uh, post bachelor certificate or even a master's. But it could be that your learner isn't interested in that or the employer isn't interested in that. You need to test for, for the interest in that before you go to all the work of putting something like that together. And that's one of the things they do is they work in very agile ways um, and with a lot of feedback from uh, the ultimate audiences of their micro certifications. So terminolo terminology is evolving. We see examples of that every day. Uh, alignment helps. Having a, a more common horizontal alignment uh, framework could help more. Uh, alignment is also about standards and it's about levels and things like that, anything that's outside. Um, and uh, if there's a, a thing that's come out of this is that it's, it's definitely easy to set up a course and set up a badge for the course and it's a great way to sort of wrap your head around it. But um, maybe it's, good, it's useful to think beyond that. So, and we're, we're seeing evidence of that with um, the boat in France and with Otago and a number of the other organisms, well, also um, uh, Madison and the Digital Credentialing Institute. Uh, starting smaller and sooner is better than coming out perfect five years from now. Um, and then embedding quality, think of quality in terms of fitness for purpose. Um, one of the interesting things that Andy uh, at Otago said was, remember, we're making Hondas, not Maseratis. It's what's good enough for to get the person where they wanna go. Um, and then uh, iterating towards uh, open recognition ecosystems through a number of directions. Um, so I see some questions starting to come up. Oh, let me see where we're at in terms of this. Uh, few, few, um, and then some potential next steps, which um, uh, it's up to eCampus Ontario. They want to pick up on some of these. I'm certainly interested in working on uh, some of them. I would say uh, additional profiles, potentially deeper profiles. I, I felt like I had to leave a lot out of even individual profiles. And then maybe some more analysis 
uh, some questions about could it be more quantitative, how many organizations are doing X, how many are doing Y, and then ways of building community of practice, which eCampus Ontario is already pursuing a number of these. And that's it. So um, ready for questions. Apologies for the uh, breathless delivery. I hope on, um, everybody enjoyed the jog though. And uh, how do we, how should we deal with the, uh, the feedback and questions? Hi Don, I can uh, read out some of the questions that we've been receiving. Um, so uh, please elaborate on the definition of endorsement. Is it something that is technically enabled that differentiates it from co-creation? Sure, so endorsement is an element of uh, Open Badges 2.0. And basically it's a third party organization says in a structured way that they um, endorse the badge and they typically say why they endorse the badge. So uh, you could build that in, in uh, say the, the description of the badge, you could build that into say criteria, well, probably description would be the place you would do it uh, informally, but it's actually an element of the open badges framework. So currently, for example, overseas um, in the HPASS project, we have endorsement of badges. So I, I have slides that illustrate this, but it's kind of beyond the scope of today. Um, we have a particular badge uh, in HPASS that's been endorsed by 12 separate organizations who uh, basically say we endorse this badge because uh, Open University endorses this badge because we worked, uh, we helped develop it. Uh, War Child Holland endorses, endorses this badge because it's part of our induction pathway uh, for um, um, our staff. So that's uh, endorsement of badges. And then you can have endorsement, again, of the, an issuer that says, uh, and that's the form of accreditation. And again, it's an HPASS example. We have HPASS certified organizations. We currently have five um, that say, we meet these standards for, for learning delivery, or we meet these standards for uh, pure assessment. Um, and uh, an external uh, rigorous organization said we do. It's a time delimited uh, certification. Uh, and so that every badge that gets issued is issued by this uh, accredited organization. So that's another form of endorsement. That's what I mean. It's a sort of an actual structured thing rather than informally uh, built into the story of the badge. Great. So micro certifications versus micro credentials, same, same, but different. Oh, I don't know how to handle that one. Um, so micro certification, my understanding of the term micro certification, it was coined by eCampus Ontario to sort of stake out some new um, territory in terms of uh, vocabulary that might have less baggage. That said, I don't see a huge difference between uh, micro certification of eCampus Ontario and what uh, Bev Oliver from Deakin University would call a, a micro credential, except uh, for things such as um, uh, industry relevance, you know, and that's, and that's really more the framework. Is that part of the underlying definition? Not sure. So I often use them interchangeably. Oh, Lillian wants to answer that live. Do you want to chime in on no, that, Lillian? I think she was just saying that you would answer it live. Just marking it as answered. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so we also have a discussion about um, IBM's recognition of different roles, so master, instructor, author, within its micro cert system. Um, so we're wondering if anybody, if we know of any other examples of this kind of approach. Uh, I'm sorry, because um, I think I was reading a different one. Can you run that by me again? IBM's recognition of different roles, example, master, instructor, author, within its micro cert system is interesting. Anyone know of any other examples of this approach? Ah, okay. Um, well, I mean, this, um, there are elements of that. Um, let me think about that one and I'll come back. Ba basically what it comes down to, it's typically not shared within a particular framework. You have ways of referring to people uh, in terms of uh, what, what, the, what they know and can do. Um, certainly the IBM one uh, works and you could probably map it to uh, what the DCI did with their uh, badge taxonomy. I, I'd probably look there first. Great. All right, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, you can either ask them in the Q&A or come off mute.
can probably, uh, there's a question from Juanita there that uh, I could, I'm, and, and just to say, I don't know <laughs> um, where our government will land with the Ontario Qualifications Framework. Um, not sure. Um, one of the, one, you know, there are other options. Uh, one of them is to look at the transnational framework. And I know that Humber uh, is, uh, I think, pretty sure Humber is looking at that. A number of uh, other institutions is it uh, I'm, I'm disremembering I think KPU is one of one institution that that looks at that so there are ways of sort of leapfrogging and saying what if what if you map to a meta framework uh, like the transnational one or the EQF I hope, I hope that's helpful <laughs> I'm not sure the government that's where the government's going this has been so helpful Don thank you so much and I think we can end the webinar here unless anybody has any last questions, last chance to get them in. But I think you've covered everything and we'll share out that link once again. And thank you so much, Don. Really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your research with us. Great. Well, it's, uh, it's been great to do it. And feel free to reach out to me, either uh, my email that I've uh, given there or at Don Prezant if you're interested in the longer version because uh, lots of great material in that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.